Hello, and welcome to the Company Town Executive Roundtable for the LA Times. I'm Anusha Sakui. And I'm Ryan Fonder. And today we're joined by Jim Bertson, president of Creative Artists Agency, Nina L. Diaz, president of content and CCO of Paramount Media Networks and MTV Entertainment Studios, Charles D. King, founder and CEO of Macro, Abhijay Prakash, president of Blumhouse, and Stacey Snyder, co-founder and CEO of Sister, and Tony Vincicara, chairman and CEO of Sony Pictures Entertainment. I want to start off by just asking an open question and asking you, uh, what was your biggest success this year? Uh, Abhijay, I wanted to ask you first. Sure. Yeah, thanks. And thanks again for having us. Uh, for, for us, Blumhouse, we're in the horror, thriller, true crime genre storytelling business. And for, it's amazing that it's having such an incredible culturally resonant moment. And we've been the beneficiary of that. So everything on film and streaming that you see in those spaces from us and from others is just connecting with consumers in such a big way. And we've had some wins in there, too, in, in, in the streaming space and also in the film space. I've had to pick one. Mm -hmm. I would say Black Phone, this original theatrical horror movie that we did that came out in the summer with Scott Derrickson and Ethan Hawke was a tremendous success. I think it also helped kind of assuage people's fears about what's going to happen with theatrical. Grossed 160 million worldwide and is doing extremely well in uh, the ancillaries and doing great on Peacock and in streaming at home. So that's the one I'd pick out, uh, not just because it's one of the most profitable movies we've ever had, uh, but also because of what it meant kind of culturally and for the business. Thanks, Jim. Well, for us at CAA, um, you know, the biggest, there's so many things that have gone well in the last year, but the thing I'd have to point to is we closed on the acquisition of ICM, which added over 450 new colleagues to the company, um, extended us around the world, and we integrated it as well, and that's been a great success so far, and we're thrilled to have finally gotten there. Stacy, tell us your win this year. Well, uh, we began the, the, uh, the company six months before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the biggest win for us is that the assumptions that we made before the pandemic, uh, that we'd be able to scale walled gardens, that being independent would be a benefit to consumers and to our creative, creative partners, that being international would be valuable and that being platform agnostic. It's been great to see as we come out of it this year that all those assumptions that we made early on have, have borne, borne out and we're in production on you know lots of shows in the UK. Started our first film with Dan Levy mm. uh, this past week. So it's reassuring to know that the assumptions we made before the pandemic about what an independent media company can be and should look like have uh, borne fruit. Charles? Yeah, same thing. Uh, over the course of the pandemic for us, we actually doubled, more than doubled in size. Mm -hmm. And we invested in two verticals where we really um, doubled down on our representation group, uh, M88, which represents uh, top tier filmmakers, uh, movie stars, um, producers, and multi hyphenate artists. And also our television studio, where we really evolved our television business from being just non-writing executive producers or actually investing and building out an infrastructure. And then what we've seen over the course of uh, 2022 is that that investment's now really paying off with so many of our artists now being at the forefront of the cultural conversation of movies that are in the awards campaign or movies that are being released throughout the course of this year or next year, as well as our television business, which is now at several of our shows, uh, been greenlit that are now going to be shooting in 2023 as, as, a, as macro being the studio. Awesome. Nina. Um, in addition to expanding our hit franchises like Yellowstone and The Challenge, um, for us, we're really proud of um, strengthening our commitment to diversity and inclusion, uh, starting with uh, the Mental Health Guide, which we launched and founded last year. And uh, we have 20 industry partners now, including Sony, thank you, Tony, and Amazon, and NBC Universal. And uh, we've seen uh, dozens of, of um, industry partners incorporate these storylines into their content. And we've had over 50 shows that have uh, incorporated mental health storylines uh, last year, including um, uh, Wolfpack, which is um, coming out uh, in 2023 with uh, Jeff Davis. And then it's our commitment to um, BIPOC and women storytellers. So we've had a $250 million um, commitment to producers and creators and 
also uh, mm -hmm. partnered with um, A-listers uh, like uh, Eva Longoria, Courtney B. Vance, and Angela Bassett, and John Leguizamo, uh, and many others to make uh, content that brings forth fresh voices and amplifies uh, untold stories. Awesome. Tony, you got a big win at Sony this year you want to talk about? We, we've had a lot of big wins. It's been a, it's been a very exciting year. And like, like Stacy, we're an independent studio, very different kind of independent studio. But, you know, five years ago, we set a strategy of being what we euphemistically call the arms dealer for the industry. And it's been unbelievably positive for us. But, yeah. but in the year, in the last year, you know, we've had a lot of very positive things, two of which are, one, we're about to uh, consummate a merger in India between our uh, channels business and our SVOD business in India with with Z it uh, will be either the number one or two media company in India which is the fastest growing country in the world fastest growing economy in the world so we're very happy about that and secondly um, uh, Funimation and Crunchyroll came together our two anime services and that has gone extraordinarily well we're nearly 10 million subscribers there and you know, it's not, uh, it's a very profitable, unlike most of the other streamers in the <laughs> world, it's a very profitable one. And we have another, another uh, Faith and Family SVOD service, which is also doing very well, nearly a million subscribers called uh, PureFlix, which we started a little more than a year ago, but we'll achieve that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, so no one here will be surprised to hear that the business model for Hollywood is in flux in a major way. The time movies spent in theaters has shrunk dramatically in the last year or two, and no one who owns a streaming service right now seems to have a really good idea of whether it's an actual good way of making money. So I'll go to Tony with this question first, and that it's basically the opposite of the last question, which is what are you most worried about? What keeps you up at night? Well, I don't think there's many things that are that we're really worried about right now. The you know you talked about the film business being not as much viewership happening in theaters, but that's because there's not enough films in the theaters. When you put a good film in the theater, it does well. Spider-Man did 1.9 billion without China. Mm -hmm. That's something that we do worry about. China and Russia is now a non-market for us, so those things are concerning. But if you put a big, a good film out, you, you, Nina, your company had uh, Top Gun did very, very well. Black Phone did very well. If you put a good film in the theaters, it does well. We had Woman King in the theaters just recently, which crossed over into a very broad audience and is doing very, very well. And we're hoping that it'll get into the into the award uh, consideration this year. It's a terrific movie if you haven't seen it. Um, and on the TV side. The business has changed 180 degrees. It, it went from, you know, a business surrounded by, or th that surrounded the, the uh, upfronts in April and May for broadcasting cable networks where you produced your shows. I ran a broadcast network for 10 years and it was a very predictable, very simple business. Not so much anymore. You don't do deficit financing for the most part. Most of the shows you do produce are, are uh, work for hire and it's now a volume business. Instead of getting 22 episodes and hopefully five years of uh, uh, five seasons, now you get you know, eight, 10 episodes, maybe 13 if you're fortunate, uh, much higher uh, per episode uh, cost going into these shows, and you're lucky if you get three seasons. So that business has, is evolving rapidly and drastically, but, but still a very, very good business for us. Yeah. Does anyone else have any major worries, any theories as to why anxiety seems to be the big buzzword of the, of the moment in this business? I mean, I do think there's opportunities for, for us to be making shows in lots of different places. If, if I'd have to say that my big worry is about discoverability. Mm -hmm. And I think that the um, valuable content is content for which there's an affinity where you can build community, where people can really experience it and talk about it. And that's what has always made the libraries of the studios that we've all been at really valuable. It's not volume, it's, it's familiarity and affinity. And so I do worry that with the volume and with the um, split attention, that the opportunity for that um, close connection between the audience and the, and the creative work um, is harder to build. And navigation. And navigation, is, that's right. Exactly right. You're talking about great stuff that being produced for a lot of money and just getting lost in the shuffle. 
Exactly, and, and I, I think that, you know, what the studios have done in the past so well, whether you call it a multi-platform approach or you call it windowing or you call it first windowing, is make them at the, the, the shows so readily and easily available that people can discover them and then talk about them and feel a connection to them. And I think that that's what creates value for the creator, that's what creates value for the studio, is um, that familiarity and affinity. Most companies seem to have a streaming service now and a lot of analysts are thinking not all of them are gonna survive. I wanna get your views on what you think the next phase of the streaming wars are. Um, Jim, do you have an insight into how you think it might evolve? Well, I'm not going to predict how it's going to evolve. I would say one thing of what Stacy was saying that's on the other side, if you look at what we're seeing at CAA, one, there's robust competition amongst them. Mm. You know, there's a, we're reading the same things that everyone else is seeing. But as we sit here today, great content, great projects, that differentiate programming strategies is in high demand and is sought after. And our pipeline, I, you know, the number of opportunities, the quality, the size of those opportunities, I think is unabated as we look at it, about as robust as we could imagine. Th that's great for our clients. It also speaks to the competition that is amongst these streaming services that are large. It's why, well, I guess, Tony, rightly labels him his company as an arms dealer in a positive way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from my standpoint, I, I don't know, you know, you've seen a consolidating marketplace for the last few years. I don't know if it's ripe for more consolidation or not. What you see is that these companies, even if they're in flux, for the most part, these are very, these are very large spends and commitments into content. And from where we sit right now and for the content that the projects that differentiate their programming strategies, it's still really robust. And Nina, you obviously have a streaming uh, as part of your remit. And so uh, how do you see the competition evolving? I mean, do you, th do, you, do, you see, do you see streaming companies dropping out? Disappearing. As, as, as Jim said, it's hard to, I, I'm, I'm not one to predict. I focus on um, the content and the creative. And in my opinion, um, content is king or sometimes queen in my case. Um, and it's timeless and it'll be here to stay. If you make that connection mm -hmm. with people and you make, you build out universes and you make um, hits that can connect with people and that have legs. Mm -hmm. Your, your fans will follow you mm -hmm. wherever, whichever platform you have. So we're lucky enough to have that ecosystem of a linear business, a broadcast business, P+, Pluto, and we see how each fuels one another, but it's all through really great content. Mm -hmm. um, Abhijay, can I ask you, because Blumhouse was one of the early innovators, I feel like, with content and streaming and... Uh, and you know, bring you know how long movies might stay in the theater. And I was curious what your outlook is for streaming and how, sure. how it might evolve. I th look, there's a lot that they're that the streamers are trying to figure out right now. You obviously have this macroeconomic uncertainty that's looming over everything, a fear of a recession, you know, obviously war uh, in the Ukraine, and how will that impact gas prices and what people are going to do with their time. And so, in that environment, and the stock market pressure that all of them face about you know demonstrating a path to positive cash flow. They've got to figure out how to compete and win subscribers. <clears throat> and so that's going to manifest itself in different ways. Uh, obviously, there was a period of great aggressiveness coming at, coming for, you know, pay TV rights, which, you know, we're the beneficiary of via Universal. And I know uh, Sony has done well uh, in setting their deals up in a similar fashion. That, that kind of already happened. And now what's next? One of the things I think we're hoping for, particularly when it comes to uh, the model that you referenced, Anusha, is we like to bet on upside, bet on ourselves, right? Make the content, film, or TV for the lowest price possible, and then participate in the wins. And that model doesn't really exist in streaming. So one of my hopes is, frankly, as streamers are trying to kind of reconfigure how they approach the market and do deals with content suppliers, that there's a way for the model to shift a little bit. Maybe instead of worldwide in perpetual, you know, in perpetuity buyouts uh, for cost plus, uh, it's a licensing period. You know, you have a version of what used to exist with studio economics where we can participate either by owning rights 
or by getting contingent compensation based on views and change the model a little bit and actually have it where we can participate in the wins. And, uh, and maybe there's a way for that's a win-win setup for the streamers too, where you're paying a little bit less upfront, but more in success and it better aligns payment with performance. And if anyone else wanted to chip in? Anything? I would just say as an independent studio and company that has a multi-platform approach, within the chaos of what's happening, that's where we're finding opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I would completely agree with Jim that there is so much demand for premium content. So when you're not aligned with one particular distribution partner or one, or you don't, you're not attached to a streamer, you have the ability when you have content that's in demand where you can leverage the marketplace, you can leverage the interest with numerous platforms to get the economics that makes sense for you as an independent company. And what we're seeing is there's robust interest in the types of content we're focused on. We're a media company that's focused on the BIPOC community, you know, with people of color at the center of it from a global perspective. And it's clear that the numbers of this demographic are, you know, driving earlier subscriber growth. They're watching more content and at a higher percentage. And so it's actually working in our advantage because everyone with all these platforms recognize that there's growth in the area that we're focused on. And I would just add that for, for companies like yeah. Charles and, and for Sister, um, being a good partner is good business because you, you just want the platforms and studios that are distributing your shows to know that you have experience and that you can be relied upon and that they can put their head on the pillow when Macro or Sister you know, is, is taking care of production and that we're both independent means that if there's a change somewhere in the, in the ecosystem, we can pivot. And so on behalf of the creative people that we work with, we can do the very best we can to de-risk um, the, the opportunities that they're creating that aren't, um, they're, they're not replicatable. You know, each show and each movie that someone makes means something so personal to them. Mm. So our, our um, optionality and flexibility is, uh, is, is good, um, you know, protection in the storms. So what's the future of theatrical? You know, I think in the last few years, even before the pandemic, we've been mm -hmm. talking about like the superheroification of everything. And the only thing that's working is tent poles and, and horror movies. I mean, is there room in the middle? And Charles, I'll start with you. I mean, well, clearly, I mean, we saw already, there's, there's absolutely mm -hmm. still gonna be theatrical. I mean, we, mm -hmm. I mean, but I mean, clearly they saw tremendous success with Spider-Man. They saw amazing success with Top Gun. I was just at the premiere this past week of Wakanda Forever, and I can only imagine how what a global hit this film is going to be. There are certain eventized movies that will absolutely work, and they will be as big and as robust as they as they've ever been. Um, but uh, clearly, that's not everything. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be the bulk of movies are going to be on streaming platforms, and it's going to be right, you know, for movies that are in the middle. But there are those niche market. I agree with the the Woman King, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, genre movies that Blumhouse is making, absolutely they're smart bets. And those are some of the things for us as an independent company, there are those movies where you finance smaller ones you think have that upside, and then there's some movies that are better for partners in a streaming arena, and then there are ones where you take that ride when there's going to be a global hit like the ones we've seen, when they're based on IP that uh, the world is recognizing. I would, uh, I would challenge your assumption, Ryan. We had yeah. four films this summer, all original. Uh, we also have Temples, but we had four films this summer, Bullet Train, uh, Where the Crawdads Sing, uh, Woman King, and yeah. Lila the Crocodile, all doing well. Yeah. All original films, and they're doing very well. What we're seeing right now is what we've been calling the COVID intermission. Two years ago, people weren't producing films, and we're seeing that right now. You'll see November and December be very strong box office. You'll see January, February, March be a little softer, and then starting next April, May, it's going to be crazy in terms of the number of massive releases and big movies. As I said, what you're seeing now is there's just not enough films in the marketplace. And films like ours, the films we had this summer, benefited from that because there's no competition or very little competition. But next, next, summer, next spring and summer, it's going to be back to normal. Well, we will see. <laughs> and when uh, COVID ceases to be an excuse for yep. anybody, right? Yep. Yeah. I'm not sure it's an excuse. There's just not, there really and truly are not enough films in the marketplace. When there are three or four films released in a particular week, it's back to 2019 numbers. Mm -hmm. And we look mm -hmm. at these obviously very closely. 
it's and, still in a state of recovery yeah. right right now, like Tony's saying. So you have supply, and then there may be are some, you know, the demand of for, an, an impetus for people to leave their house. That was an issue we were all facing before yeah. the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. The the improvement of in-home screens and uh, the availability of content on streaming services or social media, the other things, all those things accelerated during the pandemic. And so the threshold for getting people to leave their house, that bar is high, it's probably higher, but it doesn't mean that you can't still gross. I think what'll be really fascinating to see is you know, what clears that threshold, what gets people to leave the house. We've got some data points along the way, some of the ones you were citing. Uh, and then it becomes about what your vantage point is. Are you an exhibitor and you're worried about just overall admissions? You kind of don't care where it comes from or you have a specific content, uh, you know, uh, angle that you play. And, you know, for us, obviously, that's in the genre storytelling space. But if you were in a different position, you're going to evaluate that differently. You have to come up with a business model that works for your movies. But I think you can't count on theatrical uh, to still be a robust marketplace on the other side. Yeah. For sure. I, I would just add that I, as a fan and, and as someone who just <clears throat> loves what, what, as fans and people that love what we do, it's exciting for me to hear you say to keep the bar high. I love that. And I, I feel like, you know, having that as a challenge to really interrogate, is this suited for um, uh, theatrical? Is it suited for streaming? Is it, is, is it suited to get people out of their homes? That's the kind of challenge, yeah. you know, I want everyone at Sister yeah. to be excited about. And I think it's the right, the right motivation for customers that we're supposed to care about. And right. It's actually a great moment to be in, the, I know it's a counter uh, kind of contrarian point of view, but it's a great moment to be in the movie business if you just think of it the way that Stacy put it, right? You've got some things, they all end up on streaming, right? Some of them start yeah. in theaters and some of them go straight to stream, but there's a great business model for the movies. If you can get into the theaters, you get the benefit of theatrical exposure plus downstream pay money that comes from streamers, or you start on the streamers, and that's a great place to find an audience for certain kinds of movies. So if you calibrate it right, um, it's a really great time to be producing. And that's the biggest films. thing. You have to calibrate it totally. right, mm -hmm. and the yeah. windowing, and I'm sure what you've seen the success with Sony is you made sure to hold them in theaters just long enough to really maximize well, the value. Well, it's a really good point. Yeah. You talk about windows. Yes. <laughs> You know, it used to be if you dated a film, Stacy knows this, if you dated a film, it was there and it didn't move. Today, right. they all, everything's moving. Yes. Everything's very fluid. And, and it's going to continue to do that. And the, the length of the window is now different for every film. You know, as it should have been before, it the, have been before. Have been exactly. before the pandemic. Exactly. Some films are 17-day windows. Some are 45-day windows. Some are 53-day windows. Some are 90. Yeah. Spider-Man was over 100. So, you know, you, you customize the window right. to how the right. film is, is uh, performing. Exhibitors weren't thrilled about that, but, you know, they've now come to understand that that's the right way to do it. And yeah. it's a better business model because when, when films go to home entertainment and they're on a shorter window, you don't have to market it twice. Yeah, that's right. Which is a benefit of the market. Huge benefit. Jim, what were you thinking? I mean, I think it, because, it, you know, this question has been asked for as long as I've been around the media business, mm -hmm. and often it has obviously evolved. Any way you look at it, the theatrical window is healthier than it has been the last two years. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, we shouldn't lose sight of that. And I think the flexibility that Tony's referencing is actually evidence of it being in a healthier state. A lot of the trends um, that you're referencing were there before the pandemic. I think the pandemic exacerbated those. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that whether it's theatrical or episodic, there's more content being made than ever before. The quality of that content is very high, and that content can be, you know, when we look at it through the lens of CA, we're trying to just place the content for the right platform. Whether that's a hybrid experience that includes theatrical or doesn't include theatrical, or it's a wide release, like Spider-Man and Top Gun, um, and Black. And maybe we shouldn't be thinking about it in such a, a um, kind of one or the other way. But, you know, the, the arms dealer approach is so impressive because it's imagining mm -hmm. that when more people can see it in more places, there's more touch points and more connection, and that content is just more valuable. Yep. Yep. And, and we, we've known that. Um, all through the, the more analog periods when it was just these more set windowing periods, but it still applies. Yep. What we're talking about here really is the change of 
the economic model in Hollywood and how people get paid. And right. Jim, I wanted to ask you. But Jim doesn't. He doesn't care because his cash flow <laughs> just rings either way. <laughs> well, I mean, all I of you. I care deeply. <laughs> <laughs> For many reasons. Yeah. Um, people are thinking about how they get paid. What is the big ask that your clients are asking for now in their deals? Mm. Oh. Mm. I, well, but they're asking for the same things, um, but asking the same thing of us that they, they have always... More, more money. Which is the best deal. <laughs> but, but in terms well, of, like, how, you, how do you get paid? Like, how do they feel secure in their deals? It's, it's not only about guaranteed compensation. If mm. you, the creator is willing to bet on the prospects, mm -hmm. that's better than most, mm -hmm. uh, as you just said, then you want to create a deal that aligns interest on the upside if that's available to you. Mm -hmm. It's also about making sure that the client, whether they're in front of the camera or behind the camera, has the support and flexibility in, that, they, that they crave that helps them achieve their ambitions. That takes them from one, you know, that you're advising them about what's the right place, what's the right home for their projects to go. <clears throat> and are they gonna be marketed? Are they gonna be found in a very crowded marketplace you know, is there support behind it? And those things have always been true. They're much, much more true today with a more complicated media landscape. You know, the business models of all the big streamers are different from each other. You know, everyone Absolutely. at this table that, who is dealing with them has to tailor how they're thinking about each place. It's not... This, it's not like it's one deal mm. that goes across the market. It's all different. I wish that the that the studios and the and the distributors and the streamers recognized also that when creators have skin in the game, their work shifts. It just does. I've been on both sides of it now, and I've I've worked hard for bonuses when it was on that mm. side, <laughs> and you work hard for your participation, and you know when it's on this side. And I think if, 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 if there was an understanding that the crews, the cre everybody works harder when, um, yeah. when they know that there's skin in the game. The business models have changed so much. If you think, if you think about how, how it all works, you know, the, the streamers, as you said, each, they're all very different uh, models of business. You know, Amazon looks at one thing. Netflix is the only pure streamer in the business. Everybody else is totally different. Apple has its own, you know, KPIs. Amazon has its. Paramount Plus has it. They're all different, and you have to really look at that. But but the business model between, as we I talked a little while ago, the business model in television is on is flipped on its ear. It's exactly opposite of the way it was in the film business. A streaming a streaming film from the business perspective is totally different from the streaming business, from the uh, business model of a film that goes to theatrical. You have 10 windows as opposed to one window, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just, it, it, we have to all assume that this is gonna continue and continue to stratify over time. Yeah, Charles, I wanted to get your, your take, like for uh, creators, stars, what should they be asking for? Because one of the, uh, one of the big stories of the past year was people being surprised when their movie changed distribution method because of the pandemic yeah. or what are you hearing and what would you be advising people? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons why we launched a uh, representation division that would be complementary to the content business was that we saw synergy between how um, they, the two could work together in the ecosystem. But what we also saw is with obviously the, the very large talent agencies, you know, with CAA and um, WME and, and, you know, obviously CA now uh, acquiring ICM and you also had UTA, um, there was an opportunity for so many of the artists to have representation management that would understand, you know, not only the current business models, but also we're looking for someone to be like the CEO of how they're going to build out a multiple revenue stream business for themselves, mm. that they're brands in and of themselves and working in conjunction with their agents. And what we're seeing is we've all read the articles of very smart, you know, entertainers and media personalities taking and understanding the value of their brands and raising capital now and creating asset value for themselves and their families. And that's something I saw during my time when I was an agent, you know, as a partner at WME before I launched Macro when I was Tyler Perry's agent. You look at the, the incredible empire that he's now built, but what we're seeing is 
many of the smart celebrities who are uniquely positioned, they're doing that themselves. So the question that those artists are asking now, clearly in their deals, are making sure you're trying to negotiate as much upfront now in terms of the different potential distribution platforms and what happens if windows collapse and it's different you, and you can't really account for everything, but that's part of it. But more broadly, it's beyond what they're doing in front of the camera, but it's also what are the other businesses that they can create mm -hmm. and the other lines of revenue stream that are not just, they're, they're gonna receive just from acting in a movie or developing a project or directing, but it's the the halo effect on a longer term companies that they're launching. Mm -hmm. It's like what? Reserving the rights sorry, yeah. for those things that you yeah. don't quite know what they're gonna be. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's more than just money, to be honest. You know, at, at Sister, we're capitalized um, to acquire and develop material for, for a specific reason, so that we can bake the cake and so that you can then go out to the to distributors as late as possible. So that independence and being fit for purpose is an advantage to talent just as much as the dollars and cents part of it. Because what you don't want to have happen is to be everyone's very, very hottest and best friend when the auction takes place and then head down to you know the, the bleachers when when um, you're in development. So being able to pivot, being able to, to yeah. produce your stuff before it goes to market is another thing I think talent should be um, keen to, to, to uh, ask for. Um, I want to talk about linear TV a little bit. Um, former Disney CEO Bob Iger has said that the entire business of linear TV is basically falling off a cliff. Um, I'm not sure all of you agree with that since many of you are in the linear TV business, <laughs> but Lena, I want to start with you and ask what role do you see linear taking place in a world that's obsessed with streaming and direct to consumer? Uh, I mean, for us, it still plays a huge role. It's a great platform to market um, and launch onto other platforms like Pluto and P. Plus. Um, they're huge fandoms. We're fortunate enough uh, that, that are following existing um, linear <coughs> shows that then have an afterlife on streaming um, and other platforms. Um, we're fortunate enough to, have, to own our own IP and have a huge catalog that is based on our linear business. So therefore, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of hours that you know any streamer building would, uh, you know, is enviable and we're able to then move those um, hours of content and episodics to our streaming platform. So for example, Love and Hip Hop, we have 10 years of that franchise of episodes, a, a huge hit on linear, and then we moved it to um, Pluto and it's also performing, the catalog's also performing really, really well and one of the, the top channels on Pluto. Um, obviously, uh, similarly with um, the Taylorverse and Yellowstone, which is, uh, you know, the number one hit across all television. That's a linear hit. It's massive. Um, Just for the folks at home, the Taylorverse is, is Taylor Sheridan's, Taylor Sheridan's <laughs> yes. multi-pronged exactly. production deal. Yes, Taylor's universe <laughs> of, of, of characters and, and great storytelling. And so then we launched 1883 on the back of Yellowstone and moved... moved um, uh, viewers to P plus to drive subs and um, that became 1883 became the most watched um, globally so I think linear plays uh, a, a huge role and I wouldn't discount it yes I, I look at even further go go further on that point that linear is still the majority of viewing today it's mm -hmm. obviously on a downslope and streaming on an upslope but it ain't going anywhere soon. The number one show on television is the NFL. Number two show on television is Jeopardy, believe it or not. Number three or four is Wheel of Fortune. Local news, people still watch local news every day on your CBS stations, which I used to run, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is it is it is diminishing, but not at the rate that people seem really assume it is. It's still a very, very strong uh, part of the part of the business world. So what further consolidation do you see happening or deal making uh, in the near term? Stacey, you're an independent company. Do you think about that? Well, we've, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're, we, one of the founding precepts for the company was um, to enable creators, not just in film and television, but in other 
um, IP areas. So we've invested in podcasting, documentary, graphic novels, uh, uh, publishing. Um, and what's been great is to see that those companies thrive by the entrepreneurial advice and support that we can give them. And also, you know, the, the, um, to work with them because of the proximity on creating uh, intellectual property for film and television and creating an, an ecosystem. Our goal right now is converting. Our goal right now is is converting on the on the bets that um, we made, but we're always looking at different acquisitions and different opportunities. Tony, what do you think? Well, you know, consolidation is going to continue. There's no doubt. Mm. And, can I predict what it is? No. Uh, there won't be as many streaming services in five years as there are today. You know, they're all fighting for subscribers right now, and that'll continue for at least a couple, hopefully three, maybe more, I hope, years. Um, they're, it's just the way of the world. I mean, if you look at history, repeat, history yeah. does repeat itself, and mm -hmm. you'll, you'll continue to see that happening. I think it will continue to, to shift, but... Just, I've, I've been in the business for 30 years, and I'm sure, like everyone else at this table, have seen, uh, you know, endless shifts and consolidations. But one, but again, great content always rises to the top and is the is you know is the steady eddy. Mm -hmm. um, so at the at the at the core of our business, it's it's owning our own IP, making great content, and I think that will stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. And you've been building your business, so. <laughs> We've been building organically. Mm. Um, I would imagine over time, you know, as we continue to scale, uh, particularly as we go into a very, you know, challenging economic climate, <clears throat> of course, the next couple of years. Mm. Once again, where there's chaos, there's opportunity. Maybe mm. it'll be other opportunities to further scale, mm. uh, whether it's you know through partners, through acquisitions, and and uh, I do think that once again, uniquely positioned, you know, uh, great talent, uh, great content will always, I think, rise above what's yes. happening in the marketplace. And I and I think that we'll continue to see consolidation, mm -hmm. but there will always be those like outliers and those leaders within each specific area. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, we're also seeing worries about a recession and inflation and all that stuff going on. And some of the major media companies have made some serious cuts in the last mm -hmm. few months. And there are a lot of people who are worried that the brunt of those cuts will be felt by women, people of color, and there'll be some kind of regression in the gains that the business has made on diversity and inclusion. So anyone can answer this question or throw out theories, but how can companies continue to promote diversity within their ranks and throughout the business at large? You know, diversity is, is the core of what we do. You know, the world is changing as we speak, as we're sitting here. You look at Los Angeles, 56% of the population in Los Angeles is Hispanic. And if you're not dealing in that audience, you're not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the woman king, bring that up again, that's, that is, there's a massive market that wanted to see that movie. We saw that. I don't think too many other studios would have taken the risk to do that. But yes. we're doing, we're doing the George Foreman biopic right now. It's going to be a, we think, a nice, a nice, we're doing the um, Whitney, Whitney Houston biopic right now both with black directors, and, you know, we're, we're forging ahead. And what about behind the camera in terms of ensuring that there's a pipeline for uh, either executives or, or crew? Well, as I said, all the, many of these films have diverse directors, mm -hmm. and we're going continue, to continue to build on that. You know, it's not where it should be. It's, going to, it's getting better and better, at least with our company. I don't know. I can't speak for others, but it's a very, very big focus for us. There's a moral imperative, but also like a business justification Absolutely. for it. You just see over and over again. And so if it's good business, it should and will continue. And certainly that's the way we're oriented. There's, I mean, we've commissioned, not, I mean, it's part of our culture at CA. Um, it's a very inclusive culture to begin with. But beyond that, we've done, to your point, so many studies that prove that for programmers, the more diverse the programming is, yeah. the more it reflects the population of viewers out in the world, the more successful it is. And that's true in theatrical, that's Absolutely. true in episodic. And, and on Broadway, too. We have yep. the MJ Broadway play is ours as well. Um, you know, it's, it is something we absolutely focus on, and it is the core of how you build your business. I, I would, I mean, I would concur with all of, all, all of my colleagues here and say that, um, you know, it, 
it is an imperative for all of us, but I would also encourage all of us to think beyond just DEI here and think about um, the world at large, the, the, global, the global nature of what we do. And one of the things that's been wonderful and eye-opening for me to see is having you know, a, a robust TV business in London um, through Sister, you know, has opened up all of these international creators to us. And you realize, you know what? That's, that's where our business is going. That's, and, and we all have to be mindful of that. And it's important to do it organically and not force it, not push. It has to be done in an organic, natural way. And that's so important. I don't know that our business is doing it quite well enough on that score yet. I think we're pushing it in very different ways that don't feel organic. I would incur, I would definitely concur with all my, my colleagues here. Mm -hmm. I would say that we've seen tremendous growth. I mean, there's more interest than ever than each of the agencies, mm -hmm. than every one of the studios for diverse artists and storytellers. Mm -hmm. We've seen more first look deals and pod deals for, you know, talent of color than ever in the entire 20 plus years I've been in the industry. We've got division heads of, studi of studios, um, you know, that are, you know, women of color, you know, across you know across the landscape, you know several really great examples, including Nicole, the, uh, my friend Nicole, Nicole who oversees yeah. TriStar uh, over at, at, at Sony. Yeah. But I, I would say that the things that we still have yet to see are the chairman level, the you know head of the agencies representing that audience. That you know that's some of that's going to take time. But I think those are steps that are we're moving in that right to, in the right direction. But there's still a lot of growth that needs to happen Absolutely. there, or more companies like macro that have raised significant capital that are independently owned that are you know generating substantial you know kind of value in the marketplace i'd say there's steps that we need to take there if there were anything i would say more growth needs to happen in, in that arena yeah. mm -hmm. okay. i mean for us it's woven um into everything we do and absolutely makes for better business and it makes for better creative having, you know, all of those different um, voices at the table. You know, one of the things Stacy mentioned in international business, it's in, in ours is obviously a massively international business, trying to be, you know, in the U.S., it's one thing. In, in India, what's diverse in India? Mm -hmm. What's diverse in, you know, in yeah. uh, other countries? It's mm -hmm. something that is very difficult. In, in Japan, yeah. which is our own country. Socioeconomic and a range it, of voices, because exactly. in each of these communities, yeah. there's, there's caste systems and, exactly. and, and things like that, where there's underserved mm -hmm. voices in each of those communities, and exactly. having partners in those markets that really understand that, those nuances. Yeah. And big audiences. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So I wanted to ask uh, what projects you might have on your wish list, things that you might hope to make. Uh, Stacy. You know what, I, 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 for us and for me personally, um, I've never really had um, a wish list. My, my, my role in the business has always been to enable other people's dream projects to come forward. Mm. And when anyone ever says to me, oh, this studio's looking for that, or they're looking for this, no, they're not. They don't know. All the shows that I envy, I can tell you the ones I envy. I, I love uh, Severance, I love Succession. I'm dying to see White Lotus tomorrow mm -hmm. night. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so no one could have crafted that b beforehand. So um, for me, it is enabling the dreams and wishes of great creative people and hoping that you know they stop at Sister you, to do that. You're not dying to see The Crown next week? I am dying to okay. see that. <laughs> I am dying to see that. Have yes. Do you have a wish list? Uh, look, we've got a couple things on our development slate. I'd say two things, actually. There's a couple things on our development slate that I just would love to see, you know, come across the line. You know, when you're working at a production company, you spend so much time toiling and you want to mm. get them over. Uh, we've evolved over time where we now get to work on some iconic franchises. <clears throat> so we're working on Exorcist right now. That's in the gates. And then we've got Spawn and Five Nights at Freddy's mm. kind of getting ready. Mm. And those are two very different franchises. And just seeing those come to fruition, working with the <clears throat> creative talent the you know the originators of both of those pieces of intellectual property and just helping you know bring that to the marketplace with our expertise that's one mm -hmm. and then the other one that I have it's actually something Stacy alluded to earlier is we have the benefit of being a content company that isn't you know a bogged down or, or attached to any legacy distribution mm -hmm. so we get to go where consumers spend time any mm -hmm. place that the Blumhouse model or sorry the Blumhouse mm -hmm. 
storytelling can mm -hmm. be relevant, where people want to hear scary stories. Mm -hmm. That's films and television, but it could be podcasts. It's certainly live experiences. You know, our stuff is in Universal's Halloween Horror Nights, and people love it. Uh, there's virtual experiences. I don't know what that's going to look like in the metaverse, but we're going to try to figure it out with, uh, with Meta and Universal. And so my wish is to see some of those things come to fruition and actually start to have real business models and commercial opportunities behind them. Because you can tell that consumers are spending time there. And we just have to figure out the right way to play. So those, those are my two wishes. Exorcist in the metaverse, I don't know how. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah if anyone had those two things on their bingo card for this talk, <laughs> congratulations. You went so long without saying metaverse. Somebody yeah. had to say it. So, well, thank Charles, you. Yeah. Do, do you have any uh, Definitely projects? Areas that we, we're looking to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the projects we've made so far have been domestically driven. Like last year, we had Judas and the Black Messiah. and was just a mm -hmm. wonderful partnership with Ryan Coogler and Shaka King and having that film get six Oscar nominations and being a part of that. And it did travel, you know, internationally and perform well. But having more projects be globally released, um, I would say, eventize four quadrant movies that we know are going to work globally. And I'd also say partnerships internationally. Like, I was just watching Parasite the other night mm -hmm. with, with my son. He was like, Dad, let's watch this. And, <laughs> and uh, actually thinking about international um, local language mm. productions that have universal stories yeah. will travel, I think will be a big part of our growth as well. Um, all right, so it's award season, so we couldn't end this without asking. <laughs> what movie or show are you championing this year? Can be something that you're personally really excited about that you had nothing to do with, or it could be <laughs> something that you are backing that you want to tout. Um, <laughs> anyone can answer this question, but maybe we'll start with Charles and just kind of go down the road. Okay, well, given that on Wednesday I was just at the world premiere of Wakanda <laughs> Forever, <laughs> um, and Ryan Coogler is my dear brother, and he's one of the artists represented by our management group, M88. Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely not only excited about that film and how well it will perform around the world when it's in theaters, but also I think that they're hopefully for, for Ryan, and so many of the actors and the talent and the crew that I think they'll be in the awards conversation. It was just beautiful, and, and I can't obviously give anything away, but um, I'm really rooting for that movie for a lot of different reasons. Wakanda Forever. Heard of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Abhijay. Gosh. Um, it's still early in the season, mm -hmm. in my view. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of things that are still coming out, and I haven't gotten all the screeners yet. But if I was going to call out one, um, certainly one of the biggest experiences we had as a family was all going to see Top Gun earlier this mm -hmm. year. And I'd love to see some recognition for that in the awards consideration. Not only because we loved it, but also I think the award show could benefit from having a movie like that yes. somewhere in the conversation. Yes. I know from being uh, on the finance committee of the Academy that we could really benefit from it too. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd love to see that one and Wakanda Forever and movies in that vein. To, to, to really get recognized. I'm rooting for <laughs> all of our <laughs> <people. laughs> And I'm fortunate, we are fortunate that we've got a lot of them. We won't consider. put you on the spot then too hard. <laughs> Stacy. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. Um, well, this is, this is um, a, a personal, uh, a, my personal choice would be Fablemans. I'm really excited to see it. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, knowing even more about the famed director. <laughs> Fablemans being Steven Spielberg's latest yes. picture. Yeah. It's going to be very personal. Well, we have two. Uh, Woman King, which we've talked endlessly about today. And then uh, <laughs> the, the other one is uh, from Sony Classics, uh, mm. The Sun, which mm. we think will have tremendous uh, pros prospects. We have one, i predict one for next year, is the next uh, iteration of uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which I think... Uh, Hopefully, I'm hoping will be the second uh, animated Oscar for that series. Got any uh, scoops you want to share with us about that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you a funny story about it if, if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, we have you know, Lord Miller, terrific people that were obviously wonderful creators. So we commissioned them to do the next write the write the, uh, uh, the script for the next uh, iteration of uh, Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse. So they came to us. With the script, it was 230 pages long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And any of those who know film, Stacey, mm -hmm. you know it's about 110 pages is usually an animated film. So we read the script, and it was just amazing. But you can't make a 230-page <laughs> animated film. So we decided to make two. Right. And we're doing one next year and one the year after. Right. So we took right. that script and split it in two and uh, went, went full force at it. Hmm. 
Nina. Um, to, to echo, I'd, I'd love to see um, more commercially successful um, projects win awards and not shy away, shy away from it, along with, uh, you know, more diverse um, content win awards. Uh, and, and in our case, that represents like a Yellowstone that I feel deserves, um, that this should be the year. We're really excited about the, the next chapter of 1923 with Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren, and it feels like um, it's a time to kind of have more of a, of a, a, a democratic approach to, to the awards where it's not just, a, you know, siloed or, you know, the, the elitism of only, uh, you know, a, 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 a set group continues to to win and just broaden it out what a hit is a hit and if it if it's ringing true with um you know audiences globally everywhere that's that that's something that we should um highlight and reward well i think that's a great place to end uh thank you again to everyone for joining us for more coverage of the entertainment industry please read company town in the la times <laughs>